Something I'm going to say this, this evening is going to be long. Well, I'll take that back. Pastor Black told me yesterday I had an hour to preach. And then just now he just said I got about 10 minutes. So. Nothing that I'm going to say tonight is earth shattering or really even original. It's going to come from the Word of God. Well, David, according to recent research, it's found that nearly 70% of pastors are so stressed out and burnt out that they will regularly consider leaving the ministry. 70%. They say 35 to 40% of pastors a mismatch of pastor skill and the needs of the congregation. I want to draw your attention this evening to a man that Not one of us would have given the Apostle Paul any grief if he would have quit. But at the end of his life, as he's writing, these are the very last words that we have of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 4, 7. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Brother David, I'm been charged to charge you this evening. And I couldn't think of a better passage to go to than here in 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Because as Paul is looking back at the end of his life, he's looking back at what he's gone through. He's sharing with us his priorities as he approached the end of his life. He didn't say, I got to preach on this many continents. He didn't say, I got to see this many people get saved. He didn't, get to, he didn't say, I got to see this many congregations start. What he simply said to his protege, to the man that he was pouring his life into, his disciple, he said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course, and I kept the faith. I want to look at each one of these phrases this evening because I want to challenge you from the end of your life. If you start now with this in mind, that the goal would be like the Apostle Paul, you were to say these things, that would be a tremendous win for everybody. Let's look at these. I fought a good fight. The words here in the Greek, fought and fight, come from the same, uh, or the, the, the English words come from the same Greek word, which literally means to agonize, to struggle, like wrestling. He was drawing on the ancient Olympic games and some, some um, well, he was, he was drawing on some imagery on that. And we enter the fight when we get saved. The moment you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you entered a spiritual battle. And you're going to need to fight that every day. Satan, he is a roaring lion, or he, he's not. He, he roams the earth as a roaring lion. Your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And friend, let me tell you, he wants to devour you. He wants to tear you apart limb for limb. He wants to tear your marriage apart. He wants to tear your testimony apart. Don't give in to him. Right. Fight it. How do you say it? Is it just because I've got intestinal fortitude and I can just fight? Fight Satan? Absolutely not. You fight him with the Word of God. Yes. You fight him by dying every day. You get up and you say, I don't want to, but I'm going to. And you do it with the help of the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. We enter the fight through salvation. Our enemy is Satan. We don't fight with earthly or physical. <laughs> You're not going to take up an actual sword, but you will take up the sword. And you'll fight this battle. Just know, all the weapons in Ephesians chapter 6 are defensive in nature except for the Word of God. 
Each one of these must be used properly for the glory of God. Brother David, I hope one day you can stand back at your life and you can say, I fought a good fight. Amen. It doesn't mean it's perfect. <coughs> You're going to think that the congregation expects perfection, but they don't. You know why they don't expect perfection? Because they can't attain it either. What they do expect is they expect to see a man behind this pulpit who is fighting a good fight against Satan and who is looking to teach the Word of God. We'll get into that in just a moment. And so as we look at this passage, I fought a good fight. It's a tremendous reminder for all of us here this evening that there's nothing that we really can do in and of ourselves. It's, the, it's us dying to ourselves and living for God. It's using the Word of God in a proper way in order, to, um, in, in, in order for us to, to uh, have victory. It's only through uh, God working, the Holy Spirit working through each and every one of us. But that's not where He, he stops. The next phrase, I have finished my course. Paul turns from the wrestling ring to the area of track and field. Here he has in mind the runners of the Greek Olympic Games, and they were required to run great distances in the hopes of being victorious. And so Paul is going to give us some insights into the race that we are running. Brother David, let me tell you, this race, this course, when he says, I finished my course, God had a course for Paul. Is a course for you. He's got a course, Pastor Black. I've got a course. He's got a course. I can't run your race. I can't run your race. You can't run my race. You're not supposed to run his race. We're to run the race that God has for us. And so run your race, brother. Run it. Figure out what it is. It's individual. And I'm not, in other words, we're not competing with each other. The, the other independent Baptist churches here in, in Green uh, County are not, we're not enemies. We're to work together. Our only enemy is Satan. It, it's not even people that are ascribed to other religions. The other religions are empowered by Satan. He's the enemy. And people are who we're to love. And so, finish your course. Run your race. I love this analogy because my daughters run track. Well, let me take that back. I have two daughters who are on the track and field team. One is in the field. She's a thrower. And the other one runs track. When they're running, I ask my daughter, because to me, that's the worst thing you could ever do, is to ask me to run 24 miles. I just, I, 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 my mind, I'm squirrel. I'm, I can't keep my mind focused running. But my, 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 my youngest one daughter, she absolutely loves it. And I ask her, what are you, what are you looking at? And she said, I'm just focused on what's right ahead of me, Dad. What's right ahead of me. And then she said, and, and she does. She runs the 1600. That's four laps, I believe, around, around the track. And when she gets to that last turn, and she sees the finish line. She turns on those jets. And she just, then all she's looking at is the finish line. I said all that to say this. I'm not trying to glorify running, but there's a, there's a principle here. You're going to get busy in life. You're going to get busy in ministry. And you're going to be busy about doing a lot of good things. And sometimes it's easy for us to be so busy that we, we lose sight of what is really important. The only thing you guys should be looking at is the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't be the pastor where you were saved. You can't be your pastor from, from Indiana. You, you can't be a pastor that has shaped you. You can't be Pastor Black. You, you're not called to do that. Keep your eyes on Jesus and be who Jesus created you to be and run your race. If you do that, I'm not going to go with the church. I'm giving that for you, all right? But they'll follow. 
If you follow what Jesus wants for you, these I know these people. They'll get right behind you when you're running the race He wants for you. And how do we know that? It's from the Word of God. Run your race. Because we know there's a reward someday. Oh, I can't wait. Reward day makes all of this worth it. It's like when you graduate high school, you think, man, that was 12 years of hard work. And then they call your name and you walk across that stage and, uh, and, and there's like a celebration, like a, a relief. I think when Paul is writing here, I finished my course, he had the idea of the ancient marathon in his mind where, where <laughs> the guy that originally ran the marathon from marathon uh, outside of Athens to Athens literally killed over and died after he delivered the news. Okay, it'll, it'll, it'll kill you. The point I'm trying to say is this. It's, it's a, it, it is a long race, but there's a great reward at the end. Yeah. We value this day so many times temporary rewards. How many of us tonight have had trophies that we won when we were kids? And now we don't even know where they're at. Probably were sold in a garage sale, right, Brandy? I mean, that's what happens. That's what her parents did with her. So. I'm just trying to say this. We can, we can spend our time doing a lot of things, but never lose focus on why or who called you and why he called you here. If you just keep that in mind, that'll, a lot of other things will work out when you realize we're up here preaching Christ Jesus and him crucified. And we're just trying to see people get saved. And we're all, running a, we're all running a race. Some of us are farther into it than others. But at the end, there's a great reward. Not only is it a home in heaven, not only do we get to see our loved ones who've gone on before us, not only do we get to see uh, people that I believe God will allow us to see, people with whom we've had a, a played a small part in reaching, whether they're uh, people from a mission field or a love offering we gave to someone who was able to take that and go win someone to Christ or whatever. But more importantly, it's the, the reward is Jesus. Amen. And if that's all heaven was about, if it wasn't about a family reunion and if it wasn't being about Jesus is enough. Yes. And there's going to be times in your life where you're going to feel sometimes that's all you have. But guess what? That's enough. Jesus is enough. So, Paul says at the end of his life, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. But then the last thing he said, he said, I kept the faith. <coughs> he means this in a couple of different ways. First of all, in that he preserved it. We talked with you back there and we'll kind of let, let everybody in a little bit about what was said, but this is what we preach. And at the end of our life, I'm, I hope my kids are able to say, you know, I may not agree with Dad with everything. He may have been kind of hard-nosed at times, but one thing he did is he kept the faith. He preached the Word. He, he didn't add to it. He kept it. He proclaimed it. He proclaimed it, but he also preserved it. You see, part of being a pastor, part of being the, the, the lead, uh, leader of a church is us finding people like Timothy, where Paul said, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Find people who can teach others and invest in them. So that we see not only will the word be preserved, but it will be proclaimed and then it will be propagated on out and down the line. Brother David, our, our marching orders are, are fairly simple. Our marching orders are to preach God's word. And if you do that and someone faults you, they don't have a fault with you. They've got a fault with God. But preach the word. 
be careful of dabbling. We talked about this a moment ago. In your opinions. Preach the Word. Have a book, chapter, and verse. <coughs> know the Bible. Read through it yearly. At least one time. Every year, read through it. Not, not necessarily uh, to get... This is not a sermon-getter book. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> you don't go to GodSermons.com and you're not going to find this message on GodSermons.com. Your messages will come, or should come, out of your devotional life out of your reading and preaching Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night may go by pretty quick and you're thinking man, what else am I going to preach? There's a whole lot in this book but preach this book <clears throat> preach it if you preach this book I, I know Gospel Way Baptist Church I know the people they'll stand behind you if you preach this book You've got pastor friends, missionary friends, evangelist friends that will stand behind you if you preach this book. And uh, hey, sometimes the book, it hurts. You ever been hurt by the book? We all have, right? Just like that mirror. I woke up, we woke up this morning in Shelby, North Carolina. We woke up way too early. We were teaching some college classes and, 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 and things. And I looked in the mirror this morning and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> This is going to take some work to make it presentable uh, before I can be in front of these college kids. And, and it's sometimes the, the, the Bible does that to us. We're going to look into it and be like, man, that's an ugly reflection that we see. But it's telling us who we are. Don't, don't get discouraged by that. Just go out there and fight the good fight. Understand that life is like a battle or a struggle. Like Paul, throughout his ministry, he encountered various challenges and oppositions and spiritual conflicts. And despite all of these obstacles, Paul remained faithful to his calling. He preserved, or I'm sorry, he persevered in the advancing of the gospel. He fought bravely against false teachings and persecution and personal hardships demonstrating his commitment to the cause of Christ. Commit yourself. Don't just say, I'm ready. Don't just surrender. But then commit yourself to the cause of Christ. I finished my course. Paul's using the imagery of a race. We talked about that. He sees his life as a journey that he has completed. Like a runner reaching the finish line. Paul has fulfilled the purpose and mission that God has obtained or ordained for him. He's got a plan for your life. That's your goal. You wake up in the morning and you ask yourself, what am I doing this morning to fulfill God's purpose in my life? And if you do that and you regularly communicate that, I promise you, every one of us here, we're going to wake up that same way and say, hey, what am I doing today? To fulfill God's commitment and calling upon my life. Paul faithfully carried out his ministry and preached the gospel to the Gentiles. He established churches, mentored fellow believers, knowing that he has completed the task he set before him. He sits down and writes this final letter to Timothy. Telling him, hey, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. The statement here emphasizes Paul's unwavering loyalty to the Word of God. You may not like what the Word of God has to say about us all the time. But just, I cannot tell you, if you don't hear anything else this evening, here, preach the Word. Come on, come on. I'm going to just a little bit. That's okay. You can talk to him for a minute as well. The church preaches the word. Listen. And let's commit ourselves to following the preaching of the word of God. Despite Paul's trials and temptations, his sufferings and all that, Paul remained steadfast in his devotion to Jesus Christ and the truth of the gospel. Don't be one... You have an example of someone who stayed faithful to the gospel. Yes. Let this be an example to you. It's an example to me. 
Let it be an example to you. Stay faithful to the gospel. Stay faithful to the word of God. Am I saying it's going to be easy? Then if the Lord tarries, God calls you to be here for the next 40 years. You'll be up here doing the very same thing for the next guy. And you'll say, if I had three more lifetimes, I've heard this many times, I'd give them to the same, I'd, I'd, I'd continue to give them. It's not because of the people, it's because of the Savior. That's done a work in his heart. He'll do the same work in your heart. Keep the faith. Hold fast to the core doctrines. Don't waver in your belief or your allegiance to Jesus Christ. Preach the word. Keep the Finish your course. Fight the fight. Keep the faith. Oh, if you could just memorize. I know you probably already got it memorized. But look at that weekly and think that's the goal. Goal's not great big buildings and all kinds of degrees. The goal is to be found faithful. I know the, the church and, and, and uh, has got a gift for you this evening. And they'd asked me at the end of uh, the charge for you uh, the, before uh, the um, Brother Bonifacius comes up and uh, gives the church the charge of the church, uh, we've got a gift for you. And we've all signed it uh, in the inside. Uh, I know I wrote a little something. It's going to be real creative. It literally says, preach the word. All right? Preach it. You preach this book, God will. He will bless. I, I'm not saying again, the promise of physical blessings. But he will bless tremendously if you keep his word. I'll bring this down to you. say preacher be yourself but be God be God fearing and be Holy Spirit led if you'll be God fearing and Holy Spirit led then you'll be a success and uh, God fearing and Holy Spirit and, and if the Holy Spirit leads you you won't be preaching anything unbiblical just remember that just remember that 
and to the church, I would say, the same thing. If you, as a member of this church, will come in these doors with the desire to honor God and the desire to please the Lord and the desire to be a blessing to this congregation, you will do well. And the church will do well. So, take your Bible if you would, turn into the book of Acts. To chapter 8. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. The fifth book in the New Testament. Have you ever wondered why it's called Acts? It's the Acts of the early believers. The happenings and the Acts the doings of the early church, the early believers. Now, in Acts chapter 8, you have one of God's choice servants, Philip. And who was this Philip? He was handpicked by God, by Jesus. He was one of the first original deacons. So let me say, say a word here. When and if this church calls deacons, understand your role. A deacon is a servant of the pastor. A deacon is a servant to the congregation. He's not equal with the pastor. He's a servant of the pastor. He's a servant of God working through the pastor. He doesn't make decisions that are not kosher, agreeable with the pastor. No, he doesn't bypass the pastor. He is a servant of the pastor and a servant of the New Testament church. Am I not over? I don't think it's on. Sorry. I turned it off. That's my fault. You see the green light? Do you hear me now? Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay, let's go to Acts chapter 8. Again, we're talking about the acts of the early believers. This servant of God, Philip, handpicked by God, handpicked by the church as a to, to do the role of a deacon. And by the way, why was he picked? Number one, he was filled with God's spirit. He was mature in the Lord. And he worked, worked as a helper of the pastor and a servant. And church member, let me say this. Come in the doors with the attitude, I'm, I want to be a servant of God. I don't want to be an assistant to the preacher. Yes. If there ever comes a time, and I hope there won't be, but realistically speaking, there could be a time when you might disagree with Pastor Robinson, then meet with him privately. Don't embarrass him or make an idiot of yourself. Excuse me for saying it like that. Meet with him privately, talk with him, and iron it out. And if you can't do that, then quietly leave. Don't start a problem in the church. Don't hurt people. Just leave. And don't go three miles down the road and start another church. Don't do that. Go join another church, but don't start another church. Okay? This church needs to be filled. You can, take, you can take your spot and try to bring somebody with you. By the way, let me say this too. If every member of this church would try to bring at least one visitor a month, you're going to have to do some expanding. Yeah. One visitor a month. Is there anybody here that doesn't know of one person that could invite, invite to church? Sure you do. We all do. Yeah. Now, here's Philip. And, and he, you know, God, he's God called deacon, and then he's a God called evangelist. And he's conducting a revival, and then the Holy Spirit says to him, Philip, go out into the desert. Let's pick it up right there. In verse 26, and the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go, go toward the south unto the way which goeth down from, from Jerusalem unto Gaza. Gaza. 
which is desert, and he arose and went. And listen, church member, follow the leadership of your pastor. Yes. We have admonished him, but more than that, God has admonished him to never come to this pulpit unless he's led by God's Spirit and to preach only what God's Spirit leads him to preach. <coughs> Support him. Encourage him. He's a rookie preacher. You understand what I'm saying? He's not old and gray-headed and full of arthritis like me, or old and bald like Brother Allen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's a rookie preacher. He needs you to encourage him. He needs you to pray for him every day. He needs you to lift him up. So here's Philip. He doesn't question the Lord. He obeys the leading of the Lord. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch under uh, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, notice this, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Had come to Jerusalem for key in on that right there. When you come to this church, when you come in here, and by the way, if you want to be if you want to be a strong believer, you need to attend church three times. A week. Yes. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Three to thrive. Let's go one step further. Four to flourish. And what's that four for? Getting people to come with you. Yeah. You understand? Did you hear what I said? Four to flourish. Bring people to church. Yeah. And so here's Philip. And he's preaching a revival. The Holy Spirit sees this man all by himself that had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And what was he doing? He was returning home in his chariot. Now, look at look what happens in verse 30. Then Philip ran thither to him and heard him read of the prophet Isaiah. And he said, Understand thou what thou readest? Notice what he says. How can I accept some man should guide me? Listen, friends. Let your motive under this new pastor is to encourage him and lift him up and to guide people to this church. To guide people to the cross. Yes. Yes. To the cross. I have but one motive in life, and that is to please my Savior. Hey. If you'll have that motive. My motive is to please, listen, not please the new preacher, not please the Sunday school teacher. My motive is to please my Savior. And I promise you, church member, if you'll do that, if you'll make that your goal, he'll never have a problem with you. You'll be a blessing to him. You'll be a blessing to everybody around you. We're passing through. See, look at um, in verse 31. He said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired to, listen, friends, the woods are full of people that are desiring something better than what Satan's given them. And if you'll be spirit-filled, if you'll be God's servant, God's child, God can use you to present to them Jesus. Now this man went to Jerusalem to worship, and he's coming back home, and he's not saved, but he's got the Word of God. And let me say this to you. Church member, Live in the book. Amen. Live in the book. Yeah. Yeah. You won't get you won't get in front of the TV what you'll get in front of your Bible. Live in the book. You'll be a model Christian. You'll be a model church member. May God help us. That God help us to be like Philip and be sensitive. Be sensitive. Here he is preaching a revival, a citywide revival, and people are being saved right and left. And then our loving Savior says, There's a lost man out here that needs my grace. Philip ran to him. And Philip didn't beat around the bush. He said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I accept some man should die? My goal, one, one of my goals in life is to guide people to Christ. Amen. To point people to the Savior. And church member, let that be your goal. Don't compare these
these two men, they're two different men. Let your goal be to support the pastor and to bring people to Christ. And be a living epistle, known and read by all men. Because that's what you are. You see, the lost man doesn't have a Bible, and if he does, he doesn't read it because he doesn't know the author. But if he knows you, he needs to know about Jesus. You need to be a living, breathing example of what a true Christian is, of what Christ was, and what Christ's present tense is. Yeah, be that. Now, let's, let's hurry on. In verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began to sing Scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Church member, live for Jesus and support this church and support your pastor. And then, in verse 36, as they went on their way, and by the way, we are going on our way, are we not? It seems like just four or five years ago when I got ordained, which was in 1979. Yeah, that's when I got ordained. I was already preaching before then. But I got ordained in 79, but it just seems like four, or five, six years ago. Yeah. We're passing through swiftly. We only have one chance. Make it good. Make, make it good for the cause of Jesus. And then it says right here, in verse 36, See, here is water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Then Philip says, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Live in such a way that people will believe in Jesus because of what they see in you. Yeah. Be a Be a flame that won't go out. Don't, don't get over here and get sidetracked and flicker and then burn out. Don't do that. Stay in the group. Stay faithful to the Lord. Stay uh, complimentary and loving to your young preacher. God will bless you for it. And just remember this. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. You know, I can slip and do things which I shouldn't. And eventually, it will all come out. And so, we <coughs> But I have never, I have never committed one deed that my Savior didn't know about. Remember that, church member. Don't get on the phone and say, oh, that new preacher, he can't preach worth a flip. Which is not true. No, don't be critical. Don't be critical. Be loving, be supportive, be encouraging. Do that. Loving, supportive, encouraging. And so, Philip says, if thou believest all thine heart, thou mayest. Now, notice down... In verse 39, And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called Philip, called away Philip. And the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. This eunuch went to Jerusalem to worship. Somebody there gave him a scroll of Isaiah's gospel. And he's reading this scroll of Isaiah. He's unsaved. God in his loving mercy, his all-seeing, all-loving God, took this servant, this submissive servant, brought him from a revival, and put him out here to see a, an act of regeneration. And that was the saving of this searching sinner. Listen, friend. Be my witness. Be faithful. See, notice if you will, in verse 40. Philip was found at Azotus, and now what does it say? And passing through, he preached. And passing through, he preached. Friends, you're passing through this life but one time 
Alan's, Alan's journey is nearly done. Mine is nearly done. Brother Jimmy, he's got this silly looking gray <laughs> goatee. That proves to me that he doesn't have much sense. <laughs> that proves to me that he's gray headed. And gray is a sign that you're dying. See, look here. And I see some bald heads around here. That's a sign that you're dying. Listen, the truth of the matter is we're all leaving here. We're all leaving. And passing through, notice this, he preached. He passed on preaching. Now, fast forward 2,000 years. Guess who's in heaven right now close to Jesus? Philip is. And guess who's not far behind, or not, not far over to the side. Searching eunuch who went home satisfied because he found the Savior. And I challenge you, church member, you're passing through all suffering. And when you leave this life, you want to meet a host of people up in glory that you helped. And you want to see the preacher and the other preacher and the lay person and say, I'm so glad that we labored together there at the church, the Baptist church that Jesus started. I'm so glad that we labored together. We didn't fuss and fight. We worked as a unit. We worked as a group. We labored together. And it is a laboring. You women that have had babies, you labor. You know, oh, to see that baby and hold that little child and then to watch it grow. <clears throat> Two months ago, I became a great grandpa. Not just a grandpa, but a great grandpa. And next, in early April, I'm going to be a great grandpa for the second time. Now, my granddaughter, who had our great son, grandson two months ago, she struggled. She really struggled. But oh, she's happy now. Listen, friends, life is a struggle at best. But you know something? We got everything we need in church member. You got everything you need to be a successful believer. You've got the New Testament church that the Lord himself established. You've got the Word of God, the perfect, infallible King James Word of God. You've got God's Spirit. John 15, I'm going to send another comforter. You know who that comforter was? That was the Holy Spirit that came into your heart and life the moment you got saved. Yeah, you got everything you need to be a successful Christian. And I challenge you, church, be faithful to this place. Be faithful to your new pastor. Be faithful to your God. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. We shall wear a crown. We shall wear a crown. In the, in, when the battle's over, we shall wear a I'm not serving to get crowns. I'm serving to get souls. I'm serving because God is my goal. Pleasing the Lord is my goal. And as a church member, let pleasing the Lord and supporting your new pastor make that your goal. And you won't regret it when the end comes. See, look. In verse 40, but Philip was found at Azotus and passing through, he preached and he did this in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Caesarea was his destination, but until he got there, he witnessed and preached <coughs> everywhere he went. And friends, church members, let me encourage you. Be a living witness. It's easy to live for the Lord and say amen and be encouraged when you're sitting in church. But on Monday, it's not quite as easy. And on Tuesday and Wednesday, it's not quite as easy. But be <coughs> passing through. He was sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He was used of God until he reached his destination. And friends, by God's grace, 
I intend to serve my Savior until I draw my last breath. Have that same conviction. And when I'm, as a missionary, when I'm not traveling, I am supporting my church. You support your church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and then bring people. Remember, <laughs> or to flourish. Bring people to church. And by the way, I have yet to meet a dedicated, happy, sold out believer who wasn't a tither. Make sure that you're giving to the church. That's God's method of, of sustaining the ministry and supporting the pastor. Okay, Brother Allen, that's about all I can think of. <laughs> I love you, and I thank you for helping me. We're partners. I'm not a member of this church, but we're partners. We're brothers and sisters. We don't all have the same last name, but we all have the same spiritual last name, and that is Christian. Christian. Brother David, we love you. We'll, we'll support you with all the kids. Okay? Uh, you support the preacher. You support the church. And God will bless you. Amen. Thank you so very much for this young preacher. And I thank you for the way that you supernaturally led him to this place. And Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will always rest upon him, on his dear wife. And I pray, Father, that this fine church gospel way, Lord, that they will embrace this young preacher, this new pastor. They'll encourage him and they'll lift him up. And I thank you, Lord, for it. Lord, please bless him now. Fill him with your spirit. Giving wisdom from on high, helping Jesus. And Lord, I, I ask you to strengthen Brother Allen. Lord, use your choice servant to Father God, as we continue in prayer for this uh, new pastor, and uh, Lord, for the work that you're going to do uh, through him, God, we, we know that. He has an enemy, the same enemy that we have, that is seeking to devour him. And so, God, I pray your protection upon him. God, I pray that he will continue to memorize scripture. God, that he will be able to um, flee, God, the, the sins. And that he'll be able to lay aside those besetting sins and things that are easily distracting him from the ministry. We pray for his, his wife and, Lord, for their family. I pray for their, both of their relationship with you and with one another. And, Lord, I pray that they'll be an example uh, of, a, of a good, faithful marriage uh, to, the, to the community here and on uh, this side of Greene County, Tennessee. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'll just uh, continue to fill him. Uh, Lord, that he would yield control to you on a daily basis. As we talked about earlier, where Paul said, I die daily. Uh, God, may he die daily as well. And uh, God, may he uh, just continue to serve you and uh, keep you in, uh, in his focus and, and doing exactly what uh, you would have him to do. I pray that he would continue to preach the word. And Lord, that he would, uh, would just allow the Holy Spirit of God to do a work in his heart and in the hearts of the, of, uh, the congregation. Uh, God, we love you. We're thankful for young preachers. And we're thankful for the potential that are, is represented. And so, Father, I pray that we would also rally around and uh, not just see this as a day where we just lay hands and then move on. But, 
But God, that we would continually pray uh, for this young family and this young man and this church. And God, we'll give you the honor and the praise for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Father, we thank you for Brother David. Father, we know that you answer prayer because here at this church you sent this young man. Father, we thank you for him. Father, we ask that as a church that we can back him, support him. Yes. Father, give us the wisdom and knowledge to do that as a church. And Father, we just ask that you keep giving him strength and Father, help, help keep the devil off of him. Yes. Father, we pray that strongly. We don't want the devil to take him down. But Father, we got to support him in order to do that. Help give us strength to do that. Father, most of all, we ask that you work with David to continue to preach the gospel, to spread the gospel, to keep pushing missions. And Father, I ask that you be with his wife, Father, to help back him when he is down and yeah. to help strengthen him. Yeah. Father, it takes a godly wife the back of pasture. Yes. Father, we thank you for Miss Carol. But Father, we thank you so much for what you've given us here. And Father, continue to strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen. faithful servant. Bless these men. Thank you for each one that come. And each one that made their way here tonight. Bless the food that we're going to have in a few minutes. In Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. This Sunday will be my last Sunday for a while. But before I leave, Pastor, come by and let him know. And I thank you for all you've done for us over these uh, many years. It's hard. Not to the life of you. Prestige of the power or whatever you want to call it. I love you. Come by and let me
hear me? Yes, sir.